If we see a watch, we are looking for a watchmaker. When we see the eye, or when we see any other organ or limb of a human being, or of other animals and plants, and also when we look at the relations between the sexes, or the relations of one species with another, or animals with their environment, we see, in every case, complex design, multiple parts integrated in a precise way, and wherever there is design, he argues, there is designer, and the designer of the whole universe, of the whole universe of life, all animals and plants, can only be God. Well, it was Darwin's genius to discover that one can have design without designer. And thereby he completed the Copernican revolution, the scientific revolution, because now he brought organisms within the realm of science, explanation by natural laws, natural laws that can be subject to uh, testing by observation and experiment. He uh, first formulated his explanation in The Origin of a Species, uh, published in 1859, where, whereas, uh, when, as we were told by Matt Bazemore earlier, uh, we are celebrating the 150th anniversary this year. Uh, this book is dedicated to natural selection. It's the origin of a species by na means of natural selection. And of the 14 chapters, nine are dedicated to explain natural selection, and five are dedicated to evolution, to the evolution of organisms, the evidence for evolution, and how that evolution demonstrates natural selection. His purpose in this book is not evolution per se, it's natural selection. This is one of the places where he summarizes natural selection, and we'll return to this. For the time being, I want you to, uh, to pay attention only to a couple of sentences. If such do occur, that is, vari hereditary variations that uh, can give advantage to their carriers, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others could have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations, I call natural selection, is one statement of many, because the theory of natural selection is developed, as I said, over nine of the 14 chapters. And ever after, in fact, since 1937 or 38, shortly after returning from a trip around the world of five years, where uh, Darwin had been in a, a, a ship of the British Navy, he referred to natural selection as my theory. Evolution was not his theory. Evolution was the support for his theory. Evolution was accepted by many biologists of his time. What was new was natural selection. And what was new about natural selection is that it was able to explain the diversity and the design of organisms as the result of natural processes, and therefore the Copernican revolution was completed. Everything in the natural world, in the world that we can experience with our senses now, fell within the realm of science. Now, this fairly simple, simple concept in principle um, has now developed enormously. Um, there is an enormous mathematical theory around it, developing hundreds of thousands of articles, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of studies that have, published, have been published in dozens and dozens of journals. Um, but the basic discovery is right here, and stated by Darwin, and we owe it to Darwin. And there is no doubt that Darwin is one of the greatest scientists of all times, and those of us who study evolution, who have a, a proper prejudice and pride, we think that he was the greatest scientist of all times. Now, the evidence that he uses for evolution 
is of several kinds in these five chapters. There are two chapters dedicated to geology, two to biogeography, the geographic distribution of organisms, and one chapter to comparative anatomy. And I'm going to look at some of that evidence uh, very briefly now. The first from geology, a field that have come of age during the second half of the 19th century. A number of studies have come to show that when one sees a strata of this kind exposed either by erosion or as near Cincinnati as I saw four or five days ago by cutting through by roads, if when you have sediments of this kind, strata of this kind, represent sediments that have been accumulating over time. Therefore, when fossils are found, as they are found uh, they are in this, uh, around these roads in Cincinnati, the fossils which are in the lower layers lived earlier than the fossils that are found up. This is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado River. So that paleontologist or geologist working on organism can construct evolutionary lines of the sand like this one of the horse started with a small horse about the size of a small dog could live about 50 million years ago to the modern horse. And many things are changing, not only size, but the number of toes. And notice also the way in which we evolutionists mark the origin of new species and their extinction. When a species derives from another one, we represent it by a branch. We use the width of the branches to indicate the size of the population, how extensive the species are, is. And notice one thing which is universally true. The great majority of species become extinct. We come only to the two kinds of modern horses, while many, many other species existed in the past. Contemporaries of Darwin were asking, where are the intermediates? If organisms come about by evolution, more or less gradual evolution, where are the intermediates between large groups of organisms? Well, they were known during lifetime, but Darwin, I mean, at the time, stand corrected, at the time when Darwin published The Origin of a Species, but he was quite confident that they will be found. And indeed, the following year, in 1860, this fossil was discovered, uh, which is called Archaeopteris, which has the skeleton very much of a reptile, of a small dinosaur. It's an animal the size of a crow, but it has many features which are typical of birds, the head, has wings, and others. 